Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. On behalf of the Wilson Center Africa Program, I want to welcome all of you to this session on youth, conflict management, and peace building in Africa. It's my honor to welcome our three speakers. We're joined by three distinguished YALI alumni who will offer their insights and perspectives on youth, conflict, and peace building. As many of you know, too many parts of Africa are still plagued by conflict insecurity or fragility. This includes conflict and terrorism in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, the Central African Republic, the DRC and Mozambique, all symptoms of deep fragility faced by millions of citizens across the continent. Today, Africa accounts for more than 50% of all peacekeeping missions worldwide. Africa may be the youngest continent in the world with more than 70% of its population being young people. And yet young people are too often not at the table when peace and security is being discussed. And their efforts at building peace at the community, national and regional level are rarely acknowledged in peace building frameworks. Africa cannot sustain peace without the active engagement and the contributions of her young people. We at the Wilson Center recognize this and for the last 11 years, we have managed the Southern Voices Network for peace building. Our work includes supporting a capacity building scholarship for young Africans working on peace building issues. And we do this because we believe there is no lasting peace in Africa if young people are not at the table or if their voices are ignored. And that's why I'm delighted to be hosting this conversation. As I said, we're joined today by three distinguished YALI alumni who hail from three countries that have experienced too much conflict, Cameroon, Nigeria, and South Sudan. However, all three are part of the answer. They are involved in efforts to find and build peace in their lands. I look forward to discussing their perspectives on the causes and drivers of peace, what youth are doing to help build and restore peace, and their perspective on the role of international partners. It is my pleasure to introduce to all of you Ms. Tembi Mavis Yaluma from Cameroon. She is a YALI alumna, president of the YALI West Africa Alumni Association, and executive director of Women and Allies for Peace and Security. Next, we have Mr. Lupe Samuel Kenyi Stephen from South Sudan. He is a YALI alumnus and the founder and director of the I Am Peace Initiative for Harmony coexistence and development. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Imrana Alhaji Buba, Nigeria. Mr. Buba is a YALI alumnus and founder and coordinator of the Youth Coalition Against Terrorism. I will engage in a conversation with our three young leaders, and then we'll open it up to a question and answer period from you, our audience. We are very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on perspectives on youth and conflict management and peace building. With that, my first question goes to Mavis, and I will ask the same question of the other panelists as well. Uh, Mavis, from your perspective, what are the key causes and drivers of conflict and insecurity in Africa? Mavis, I'll turn it to you. Mavis, you're muted. We can't hear you. Well, Mavis? Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I'm not sure I heard exactly what the, the question was. So please, if you can take it again, I will appreciate. Sure. Thank you and thanks for your patience. What do you see as the key causes and drivers of conflict and insecurity in Africa? Were you able to get the question, Mavis? Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we come back to Mavis, but Lupe, maybe you can answer that question. What do you see as the key causes and drivers 
conflict. Uh, thank you, Ambassador uh, McGreen. Thank you, each and everyone, for joining us. Um, I think I think this question, uh, when it's asked about Africa, it's 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 quite a wide broad because specific regions in Africa have different drivers of conflict as well. I think we just lost Lupe. Uh, Mavis, why don't I go back to you? Are you able to connect with us? Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, Lupe, what, please continue on and then we'll go back to Mavis. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, so as I was saying, uh, different drivers of conflict. Uh, 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 just lost Lupe again. Uh, Mavis, can you, I'll give you a, a, a chance there. Can you hear? Are you able to connect with us? No, she's from right. Lupe. You're you're back. So I don't know why I keep dropping. I was uh, uh, <laughs> I, assure right, you, I I assure you, we agree with you. So it's it's nothing personal. <laughs> uh, why don't I try Mavis? Are you able to connect? Well, yeah, I can I'm hear you. So. Mavis, why don't you go ahead? I'm, a, I'm not sure Mavis can hear us. Imrana, you are the one who is patiently uh, <laughs> looking at us here. So why don't I begin with you? What do you, from your perspective uh, in Nigeria, what do you see as, as drivers of insecurity and conflict? Uh, I think the main driver of conflict is actually bad governance. So there are a lot of things that uh, government at all levels like need to do, need to put in place, which actually they are not doing, as a result of which lead to many other causes. If you take, for example, unemployment, uh, Ni Nigeria, I say like Africa has a lot of uh, youth, uh, unemployed youth, and this provide a fertile ground for uh, armed groups like terrorist groups and many criminal gangs to include young people. There is also difficulty in managing borders, so there is large like uh, borders and it's really difficult to control due to also issues of corruption with uh, maybe some officials getting bribed to allow uh, smugglers to smuggle weapons. So uh, I think these are like the, the major like drivers, but of course there are a lot of other causes when you take issues of ethnic conflict, like issues of intolerance, when you take uh, issues of religious intolerance for different conflict, but overall, like the issue of bad governance is actually the main driver that fuel uh, conflict in Africa. That's very interesting and very, very helpful. Uh, Mavis, uh, why don't I try you? Again, the, the question is, what do you see as the causes and drivers of conflict uh, from, from where you are, from your vantage point? Thank you, Your Excellency, for giving me the floor. And uh, it's a great honor for me to be able to share my ideas here on this platform with the several thousands of viewers and uh, alumni out there. And of course, sharing the panel with uh, Imran and, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't get the other name. <laughs> so um, to me, the main drivers or the main causes of conflict in Africa has to do with structural violence. And structural violence has to do with economic, social, and political inequalities, which uh, make people or make the youths feel uh, excluded or feel um, not treated as they should be treated. So this structural violence according to the youth, or the ones that affect the youth the most, are issues of unemployment, high rate of poverty, uh, low level of literacy, and uh, of course, the lack of uh, political, lack of political uh, uh, opportunities, lack of political spaces where youths can fully express themselves and be able to share their ideas, be able to implement their own ideas. So I think that these uh, structural uh, 
causes or structural issues are the main reasons for the several conflicts that we have in Africa today because it is very easy to use this disadvantage to be able to propagate or to be able to preach radical ideas that the youth will, will, will relate to. So if these structural issues are adjusted or if they are taken care of, if most of them are taken care of, then of course it will be a little bit more challenging for, for, for people to be able to radicalize youths and push them into violent acts and of course causing conflicts the several conflicts that we are experiencing in Africa today. So, Lupai, uh, when you spoke very briefly, when we when we got ten to fifteen seconds from you starting off, mm -hmm. you said something very important, uh, even in that short time, and you pointed out that uh, the the drivers and the causes also depend on where you are, right? Mm -hmm. That there there is no one set of causes or drivers continent-wide, it depends on where you are. So from from your vantage point uh, and your beautiful country, but troubled land, what do you see uh, as drivers of conflict and, and, uh, and violence? Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I hope this time I don't go off. I hope uh, the internet will do me justice now. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I know there's one uh, big challenge that I think cuts across and that could be the issue of bad governance. But I think narrowing it down, even when it comes to governance issues, there are smaller packets that we need to unpack. So in, in South Sudan in particular, we have a whole issue of uh, uh, identity politics, where you find that most of the times governance is, is based on on, on tribal affiliations and, and, and specific identities. And, and so if certain communities are not represented in such, uh, uh, in such governance structures, they feel excluded. And so, so the best they can do is to get their space. The best they can do is like, okay, I think we're being excluded in the governance of this country. So all we have to do is uh, let's, let's claim our space. Let's get our space. And, and, you know, when you look at the history of South Sudan during, the, during their struggle, uh, for those who, for just for the context, we got our independence in 2011. And ever since uh, uh, the independence, it's been a fight of like which tribe is taking lead of the country rather than, uh, uh, what are the political ideas and, 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 and structure that are, structures that are being put in place. So since then, it's been like more, more of like regions and tribes coming together to ensure that they get uh, uh, power. And this is one of the biggest uh, drivers of conflict, specifically here in South Sudan. Another very important one is, is accountability. Uh, most of the times, a lot of people do not want to be accountable. A lot of leaders don't want to be accountable for their actions. And so, and so for, for, for them to, to, to continue their governance, for them to continue doing what they're doing, they have to always stay in power. And, and once they have the power, they will make sure that they control all the state, uh, uh, whether it's a judicial system, whether it's a legislator, who wants to control that so that they, they are not accountable at the end of the day. Recently, we signed an agreement and in this agreement, we're talking about hybrid court, a court system that holds accountable uh, certain leaders who, who, who might have been uh, causing this conflict. But of course, everybody's trying to run away from that aspect. That already means that uh, uh, the aspect of accountability and influ uh, uh, influence on judicial systems is, is one of the biggest hindrances to you know, uh, cohesion. That means, uh, and a lot of people always have to keep there. And then finally, uh, international influence. I mean, we have a lot of international actors. Uh, for any conflict, they're always international actors. Their interests are always not very clear uh, what are they, what they're really doing in, this, in, uh, in the country. And so they find any small gap that they can get and they widen it, finding a very vulnerable community. Uh, and most of the times, uh, uh, these drivers are engineered and influenced by their, by their interests. So if you find an international actor that does not have a positive interest in that particular community, then the conflict will continue. You know, it's interesting, uh, Lupai, even though you began by pointing out how different the drivers may be in each part of the continent, uh, I've also heard some similarities, some themes mm -hmm. that do unite things. Uh, and what I'm hearing over and over again is that young people can too often feel excluded, mm -hmm. that they don't have a voice 
that is heard, or as we would say, a seat at the table. And if there's no seat at the table or no chance for a voice to be heard, sometimes, and no one is defending it, but sometimes they grab that space to make sure that they are heard. So let me begin with you, and then I'll go around the uh, group again. So uh, that's been very useful. But what do you see as working involving young people and getting young people a seat at the table? Are there, are there things that you see that are working well? Okay, yes. Yeah. So uh, you find that a lot, of pe a lot of young people, knowing that the times when it comes to conflicts, they, they are the ones being used and influenced to go and, and escalate. Uh, young people have started to realize that they're being used, and if there are spaces that have not been given to them, they're using their energy to claim it. And, 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 and you find that through civil society uh, organizations and other uh, youth initiatives, a lot of people do come together and create those platforms for young people to be able to engage uh, among themselves and say, all right, I think this is what works for us. I remember there was one uh, incident where somebody said, we are 21st century uh, generation. We cannot be governed by 19th or 20th century ideas. So this is like young people saying, hey, I think what what is what is used to govern us does not work anymore and all we have to do is create our space as young people and let the let those who are in positions of power uh know that we also have a voice we are the we are the majority it's not it's not just an african setting that 70 percent of the people in africa are young even in south sudan in particular over 70 percent of us uh, uh at least 30 and below so so you find that we realize that whatever policies that are being used uh, to govern us do not necessarily work for our era. And so young people are, are creating spaces for themselves and they're saying, I think uh, uh, we need to also be able to voice our, uh, uh, give our voices out. And a lot of young people are also joining leadership positions uh, because we cannot create change unless we are in there. So, so people are joining politics. Um, uh, when you look at state governments right now, especially where I am coming from, over 50 percent of the people in the state government are young people uh, and majority of them are below the age of 35 and that is because they want to to be able to speak to the majority of the young people in the country and be able to influence policies from the inside rather than just us saying we're young people we need these spaces we need to we, we, we need these spaces we need this to be done but we also need to be involved in the process so not being given a seat at the table does not necessarily mean that we cannot do anything as young people so Sometimes we have to claim it, and that is exactly what is happening here in, in, in South Sudan. Very helpful, very uh, useful. So if, it, if I'm busy when you look at me on the screen, it's because I'm taking notes for the very good answers, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, very much appreciate it. Imrana, uh, mm -hmm. your thoughts. So, so um, in, we have a tendency all to talk about things that are not working, mm -hmm. about things that are working. What, what do you see that is working and helping to uh, build better chances for peace. Oh. Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of uh, effort uh, from government, from many organizations to address the symptoms of conflict, not actually like the root causes. So you see a lot of effort to promote peace education in schools, a lot of effort to organize sporting events to unite different groups, uh, this is actually something that you can see a lot of improvement like uh, in terms of addressing issues of conflict using a lot of those innovative uh, issues. But one thing that uh, I think many stakeholders are yet to explore is actually addressing the root causes. From our conversation here, like uh, Mavis mentioned structural violence, Lupai talk a lot about issues of like ethnic divide, uh, how politicians often divide like people issues of bad governance. So I think most of these key drivers are things that uh, many people are really not looking at them. So many interventions just focus, okay, let's address this issue, let's, let us promote tolerance, but not actually looking at what are actually the causes of those intolerance. What actually, uh, like for young people do to join extremist groups. So I think uh, these are some of the big issues 
And I think as Lupai mentioned, sometimes because there are many interests involved, there are a lot of people that really somehow uh, don't want to address like uh, some of those uh, like uh, root causes. That is why they just tend to focus the interventions on uh, maybe uh, things that are really easy to do. And at, at, at times they have little impact because it's like a, a fire like a service approach you just come to quench the fire not to really address like uh, the main cause of the fire. So I, I, I think to me, these are some of the things that are really not working and maybe they need to, uh, we need to all work on it. Great, thank you. Uh, Mavis, to you, um, we, uh, we easily talk about what is not working, but that's easy. How about some things that are working? What do you see that, that gives you some hope in peace building? Now, are this unlike the popular view where people would say that youths have been excluded, youths are considered as violent, youths are the ones that are perpetrating all the acts of violence and all of that, the trends are beginning to change, especially with uh, the advent of Resolution 2250, the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250, where youths have been able to understand that it is not just about uh, uh, they being uh, attributed negatively when it comes to conflict, they have been given something like a tool, like a force, like a push to be able to recognize that they have a place, that their voices count and that their efforts towards peace building is of equal importance as all the stakeholders that are involved. So these days you find a lot of youth activities and a lot of innovations around peace building such as uh, arts, sports, you have uh, social media campaigns, you have uh, several youth-led initiatives that have been implemented lately. And this is because we, the youths or we have understood that peace, all, all of it starts with the mindset and the uh, to be able to build a peaceful society, you should be able to come to terms with yourself that, okay, enough of trying to lay blames on others, enough of trying to stay back and wait to be given the opportunity. Now, what can we do as youth? What are the, the, the tools? What are the things that are fun? What are the activities that bring youth together? So youth have been able to change that mindset from being looked upon as uh, as violent actors to be able to uh, promote or to be able to encourage others like they are doing nowadays to show that irrespective of what you are doing, even if you are in the field of science and technology, even if you're in the field of IT, even if you're in the civil society, the government structure, or whatsoever component that you find yourself, you can be able to use that platform or that, that sphere to influence and create peace in the society. IT, IT te uh, tech guys are now using uh, their, their expertise to build web uh, webs and apps that are able to, to transmit peace messages and promote uh, promote the peace. Uh, we have uh, uh, social media platforms now that almost everybody or a majority of the youth population have access to. They have been able to use this part platform to pro uh, to counter uh, propagation or propaganda, to counter uh, violent messages, to, to counter hate speech and things like that. So we see that the dynamics have changed and youths are really getting involved in this and they are taking it personal, unlike before where they want to sit down and wait like um, my, my other speaker mentioned youths are at the point where they create the space for themselves they no longer wait but they are pushing forward to create spaces of influence for themselves either by doing in the in the civil society sphere or getting involved in politics and changing things for themselves so i really think that we are making a lot of progress when it comes to uh, youth effort in peace building maybe that's great uh, that that's very helpful uh, we'll uh, do one more question as a group, and then I have a long list of questions from the audience <laughs> that keeps growing by the second. I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best to try a few of them. So uh, very quickly, and, and maybe this I'll start with you, then go back around. Um, so if, if you could tell us briefly one thing, each of you, that you and your organization is doing to concretely uh, advance the cause of peace building. Mavis, I'll start with you, and then uh, Lupe, and then Imrana. Mavis? Thank you. 
thank you very much. Um, the Yali uh, Alumni Association in Cameroon, which I've led for the past four years, have been have had the, the peace agenda on as, as its top priority, given that Cameroon found itself in this period where we have tremendous uh, conflicts and violence from several regions of the country. So we took upon ourselves to bring peace as the center of our objective for the past four years. And what we have been able to do is to build the capacity of, uh, of, of youth, young civil society leaders, as well as change mindsets through training programs. We have organized a couple of training programs to train uh, at risk youths, that is uh, uh, youths of age that are living in the orphanages, youths that are on the street, like street children, unemployed. So we have been able to target this at risk youth, the, 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 the population that we find vulnerable to radicalization. So we have, we've identified them, trained them on how they as individuals can be able to contribute to peace building. We have been able to build their capacity to train others. We have been able to see them as to make them see themselves as key actors in the peace process, irrespective of what they are doing or the, the, the area of, of expertise in which they find themselves. The Women and Ally for Peace and Security, which is an organization that I founded after my YALI program as a result of the knowledge and skills that I acquired, right now have been able to identify a particular objective, which is to train a good number of young girls young girls in the peace processes. So we are in the process of creating this particular program that will run uh, subsequently, training young girls to become peace mediators and, uh, and community leaders to be able to uh, push forward the agenda of uh, building a peaceful society from both the youth, youth aspect and, as well as the women in peace and security aspect. Great. That, great. Mavis, that's, that's great. Lupai, your turn. Okay, um, so I I founded IM Peace Initiative when I was uh, in Uganda as a South Sudanese refugee, and and uh, after the Mandela Oshinan Fellowship, I moved back to uh, to South Sudan. But of course, the Uganda program still kept running, and one of the biggest inspiration for this initiative was because the biggest. Uh, drive of conflict we know is the issue of identity and different communities feeling superior than the others. Uh, uh, and so for us to be able to move forward, we first have to start by looking at how we can build trust among these communities. And, and we know that way we will we'll be able to create those spaces and, and conversations that, 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 that we need. So uh, as IMPs, we, we organize uh, forums where we can a lot of informal forums where we come together and just have those spaces to build trust and people to people relationships among ourselves from the from uh, as people from different communities uh, we have what we call the peace camps so the peace camps are uh, monthly programs where different youth from different uh, parts of the country converge together uh, either to explore a certain part of the country in the process build trust among themselves and and talk about uh, 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 issues that are affecting their country and sometimes we also create uh, some of these spaces uh, uh, we have what we call the Peace Pen and Pass through uh, one of our programs. It's a school outreach program where we teach Peace Club uh, members in schools and, and, and uh, uh, school administration on how they can also handle conflict from the school levels to avoid that from escalating to, uh, a bigger, to bigger conflicts. So our biggest uh, strategy is building trust among people and communities as a, as a, as a way to mitigate conflict as I am peace. Great, thank you. Imrana. Imrana, I think you are muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm the, founder, I'm the founder of the Youth Coalition Against Terrorism, which is uh, a volunteer-based youth organization that I founded since 2010, when I was just uh, a first-year student in the university. And the organization basically aims to unite young people against violent extremism in northeastern Nigeria, uh, which is a hotspot of the Boko Haram insurgency, and this is where I live. So most of uh, the members of the organization are young people that are affected by the insurgency, 
and we organize program to uh, discourage other young people from joining uh, Boko Haram and other, other terror groups in northern Nigeria. Imran, I think you've frozen on us. I think Imran is frozen. So uh, we have gotten to the place where we will take audience questions. Let me, um, and again, we have, we have many, but let me ask a, a question. Several seem to be around um, accountability. So what are your ideas for holding accountability for those who have been engaged in corruption? What is the best way to hold uh, accountability and also accountability uh, after conflict. So post-conflict accountability and uh, anti-corruption accountability. Lupai, let me begin with you. I, th I think uh, it's usually very, very hard immediately after conflict uh, to start uh, to start holding people accountable when there are no systems in place. And I think that is exactly what is what is happening right now. But the best way so young people and also those who are involved is documenting uh, whatever we feel uh, at the end of the day uh, uh, is an activity that needs that just have to be accountable for. So uh, right now, a lot of people are just doing documentation, and I think that is a very, very good strategy because now when we start to push immediately after conflict, uh, uh, when we start to push for, for accountability, a lot of people can go wrong go wrong, you know, uh, they can still uh, initiate more conflicts. So the best right now people can do is is document these stories and create systems, uh, workable systems that uh, with time can hold uh, 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 leaders accountable. And that is still on a general sense. And now when it comes to corruption, uh, most of the times corruption is because there are no systems in place not just to hold the leaders accountable, but also systems. And so when it comes to managing uh, uh, finances and, 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 and money. So you find that uh, some people do not have centralized payment systems. Some people do not have uh, other banking systems that they use to channel money. Uh, so you find an uh, has its own bank account. And so they call taxes and the money is sent to the bank account. And everybody is that in institution that manages that money. We which could work in, in, in places where there are systems and, and, and good banking systems and people can be held accountable at the end of the day. But in, in polarized situations and countries uh, where people are fresh from conflicts, you don't even know where that money is going to. You, can, you, you cannot hold someone accountable. You cannot sometimes fall the money. Recently, we had the Century Report as a South Sudan Century but talks about what has been happening in the, uh, who's been getting what money and all that. So the international community, uh, the US and other uh, countries like the UK, Norway, uh, others decided to, to uh, what is it called, uh, uh, sanction certain leaders, you know, so just at least to, you know, let them, let them know that whatever they're doing is not right. But then the, the best citizens can do with the kind of power they have is to just document to help in this was that one day, once systems are put in place, once all this is put in place, we now know who to hold accountable for what atrocities, even when it comes to corruption. Thank you. Uh, Imrana, we'll come back to you, but let me just ask Mavis to, to build on that. Mavis, your thoughts on accountability, whether it be accountability uh, post-conflict or accountability mm -hmm. in the area of corruption, what are your thoughts? Mavis, you are muted, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we still can't, we can't hear you. All right, I think we are good. There we go, great. Post-conflict accountability is of essence, it's of critical importance because it is on that basis where trust can be built. If relationships have been spoiled, if people have grievances and uh, these grievances, some of, some of them are not tackled. And uh, for example, being able to identify and uh, penalize people that have been involved in uh, crimes against humanity during conflict, 
if these things are not done, it will be very difficult for the people to trust the system that is in place. So it is very important to be able to hold everyone accountable in the time of conflict to be able to construct a, a, a peaceful process after the conflict so it is of essence that um justice is, is done and the people see that there is transparency they are they can be able they can point that okay this person did this this person did this and those people are brought to justice that is the only way that the people can trust in the system to lead them. If that is not done, then there will be no trust among amongst the leaders and the people, and hence no, no uh, sustainable peace or relationship can be developed from there. And uh, for the governance and um, electoral process and all of that, it starts with being informed. It is very important for the people to be informed what is in place, what is supposed to be. For example, what is the budget? What projects? They are supposed to follow it up, all of it. They are supposed to know leaders' manifestos and all of that. Because if you don't know, if you're not aware, how then do you hold the leaders accountable? How then do you know which money was supposed to do which project or whether it has even been done or not? Because I believe that so many of the, the, the us, the youths in Africa, are very much... Um, Politically, like we, we are our political affiliation, that spirit is even dying already. So much so that in, in a place like Cameroon, youths don't care anymore whether elections have done what or who is going for which office. They don't even know. You ask a youth in a constituency who is the leader, they are not aware of the they just say we don't care because what is what will change. But if you want this thing to be able to change, you must first of all start by getting yourself informed of who is doing what, who is supposed to do what, which money is allocated for what. And so that is the only way that you can be able to follow up and know that, okay, here there is a problem. You were supposed to implement this project. It has not been implemented. You said you were going to do this in the second term of your office. You have not done so. And in that way, you can be able to hold or generally the public can be able to hold leaders accountable for their actions and for the budget of the states. Thank you. Uh, very, very helpful. Imrana, uh, coming yeah. back to you, and it actually fits together nicely, you were talking a bit about your work on uh, identity politics and combating some of the conflicts between various groups. So then let me change the question a little bit. So perhaps you can still tell us a little bit about what you've been working on. But then on top of that, how do we have accountability where there are acts that are um, uh, pitting uh, groups against each other, where where government is failing to support and sustain uh, peace. Yeah, so uh, part of my work involved training young people to look at those issues. So uh, one of the projects that we do is uh, training young people to become peace ambassadors. So we train them not just about uh, the meaning of conflict, peace, and some techniques to promote peace. We also ask them to become civic leaders, to hold leaders accountable, to uh, change people's mindset about government, how to encourage people to ask questions, to engage with their elected representatives online, to visit their traditional leaders, to really become active citizens. Because as Marvis explained, the moment young people become hopeless, become a kind of disinterested citizens. That is how conflict continue to manifest without us really playing. So part of our work involved really building the capacity of young people to ask those questions, to really ask yeah, to really be accountable in running their affairs. Uh, no, that, that's very interesting and, and uh, very helpful and uh, very hopeful, if I can say. We have uh, another question. Uh, the question is, what is the role of education in combating conflict and uh, promoting peace building? Imrana, why don't I start mm -hmm. with you and then we'll go around. Yeah. The role of education, yeah. the importance. Yeah, actually education has a role to play, especially in our context. You know, Boko Haram like, literally means Western education is forbidden which to them is more of any education that is uh, non-religious uh, or in their own sense of religion is like uh, forbidden. So we use education as like a powerful way to really counter their message. 
once people attend schools, they have critical thinking. They can be able to know what is right and wrong. They can be able to detect terrorist propaganda. They can be able to uh, avoid manipulation. They can be able to avoid like uh, that issue of ethnic identity, religious identity, to really understand we are all humans. We can coexist. So we uh, we use education a lot, especially peace education. Even within school's curriculum, we try like to have like a specialized form of education where people are really uh, like uh, get like trainings about what it means to be together, what it means to really live with people from different ethnic background and from different religion. Uh, I believe with uh, this high number of illiteracy, like in northern Nigeria, one area like for government and I think every stakeholder to invest in is education. Uh, the moment you have educated citizens, they can easily like know what like they can do. They know what actions they can take to promote uh, development in their communities and to also avoid joining extremist groups. Thank you. Very helpful, Lupe. Your your work, education, the importance of education in preventing uh, account of, uh, preventing conflict and promoting peace. Uh, Ambassador, when we talk about education. Uh, we, we know that for one to be able to, to interact with other people, you need an open mind. So my comments will not be different from what Imbrana uh, might have said. The only thing is uh, there is there is illiterate people, people who have not gone to school, people who are not educated. Uh, but also sometimes we know that other areas have schools the question is what education are they getting so i think i think i think these two uh, these two aspects need to be diagnosed differently one uh, having you know schools and formal education in different areas but then even in that formal setup we need to start to question what exactly we are we are learning so uh, this might slightly go a little bit hard uh, I, I started in Uganda, and in Uganda we used to we used to learn a lot of of history that, to be very honest, was not relevant to us. And I remember uh, one of the history that we used to learn was more of rebellions, uh, the Mau Mau rebellion, the Maji Maji rebellion, this kind of rebellion. So, so what what do you think we are going to gain from such uh, 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 from such education? And when we talk about these rebellions, what are the points that the teachers are trying to teach the students? Because at the end of the day, uh, uh, what we learn from there the practicality aspect of it. Sometimes you want to give this uh, uh, education for somebody to be able to discern that, hey, these are the consequences of rebellion, these are the consequences of conflict. But somebody can also interpret it di differently, that, hey, I think if I cannot get what I want, the best way for me to do is also to rebel. So I think there are questions of like, what is the education that we are really getting? And then in our education here in Africa, do we start to value our communities? Especially, uh, uh, you find in, we are in South Sudan and we are learning about other countries and and yet there's no priority uh given to learn about our very own communities so that means that leaves space for other communities to continue the informal education which is more like promoting hatred against other communities hey we are this community we are better and we, we are better than the other community and so and that education is usually informal it's in the family setup and if that one is not countered by formal education and then technically uh, a conflict will continue. So education, literacy is very, very important because at the end of the day, it opens our minds. It lets people look at things from different lenses. It, it, it lets us to discern. But I think also uh, it's now that kind of education. What kind of education are we, are we going to be focusing on when we are giving to, 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 uh, uh, to our children and to, 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 to the people? So we need to focus more on like, uh, I think, uh, all African states, all African states and all communities, either in conflict or not, need to start to revise their curriculum and have the education in relevance to their communities. There, you, you get to learn about your spaces, you get to you get to build trust even from that particular level, and I think uh, we'll be able to avoid conflicts. Mavis, education, the importance of education. All right. I want to start by appreciating what the, the, the other speakers have said, but I will bet to disagree on certain aspects of it that the, the former uh, mentioned. He talked about um, the latter, rather. He talked about the 
teaching, uh, he talked about curriculum content and uh, subjects like revolution and and uh, revolts in Africa, for example. And uh, being a history student that I am, and I, I believe that this content, this, this, this particular area, it's of vital importance to the construction or reconstruction of Africa, because if we cannot identify what was, if we cannot identify what went wrong, if we cannot identify the effects, the damages that those, uh, those uh, past uh, revolutions left in our societies, we, 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 because you can see the ravaging, the deaths and all of that, and the, on, 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 on the development. If you cannot uh, access or assess all of these past revolutions and understand the context of today, you will not be able to understand when they talk about oh, revolution is bad, revolution is this. So when you, when you can put yourself in that position where entire communities were eradicated, thousands of people killed and all of that, you begin to understand the importance of fighting for peace. So it is rather a push to get or avoid getting into that same situation rather than a means of encouraging people to get to, to fight. So, but I agree with you, like you said, it depends on how this content is put out there. Because if you put it wrongly or you put partially, people can interpret their own different way that makes sense to them and they'll be tempted to implement what they understand from it so at the end of the day it is just being able to understand the context this context specific what is the lessons what can we learn from this and for general for generally education is key to 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 peace education is key to peace because like imrana said it is very easy to 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 instrumentalize a youth who is an illiterate than someone who is educated and has his uh, mindset upright or logical, or someone that thinks logically. It is not like I'm not trying to say that people that are illiterate do not think mm -hmm. rationally, but it is easier to use certain aspects and manipulate them because maybe their critical thinking skills are not fully developed and things mm -hmm. like that. So education is at the center of it all because peace, like I said, starts from the mind. So if you can build the mind to be able to identify what is right and what is wrong, to be able to make choices, right choices, to be able to think what is the what is the, the, the consequence of this action to me and to the greater good, mm -hmm. then I think that we'll be able to achieve peace. Uh, very good. Very good answers. Uh, we don't have too much time left, and I, I uh, always hesitate to introduce a new big subject when we don't have all that much time. But I've had uh, three questions come to us that talk about, uh, that ask how we can best battle tribalism and regionalism and the role that they play in conflict. Mavis, let me start with you, and I'll have to answer, ask each person to keep it relatively brief. Tribalism and regionalism, uh, it's a problem that so many uh, listeners are pointing to. What can be done? I think that if we, we are able to look at each other first as human beings, if we can concentrate on humanity, if we can focus on we are, we are a people, we are one people, whether we are from the north, the south, east or west, if we can focus our attention on humanity first, I think that we will not have the issue of which tribe are you from or which region are you mm -hmm. from or on, and things like that. And I think that it also has to do with breaking a chain of of a long history of uh, of examples that have been have, have been showcased out there because sometimes people tend to interact and just follow a trend person that brings another person from his family and the next person that is imagining that if i get to that position i know person as well so it is sometimes a train that have to be broken and this chain can only be broken by logical reasoning and logical thinking based on competency who is competent for what who is competent enough for what irrespective of where he is from it is true that regional uh, affiliation and ethnicities are also a force for social cohesion but it depends now on how we use it if we use it negatively then it becomes bad but we can also use it as a means to bring together the several 
natural fraction of people and, and enjoy a beauty of that diversity and live together as a people rather than uh, dividing or looking at each other as different. Very eloquent. Rupai, I know this is a big uh, topic for you and the work that you do. Most of the times we try to to, 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 we try to borrow a leaf from, from Rwanda, uh, looking at what they have already gone through and, and how they are trying to manage their country post-genocide. And as a country in South Sudan, this is exactly what is happening, where uh, uh, there's been incidences of certain communities trying to wipe out others. And, and, and at the end of the day, it has really affected our social cohesion. I, I, would, I wouldn't say the answer I am going to give uh, uh, is, is, is something that might be easily workable. But I think uh, we just need to engage more among ourselves because most of the times it's based on, on what we perceive of others. That means if there are more, more platforms and, and, and engagements uh, between communities or different communities, you get to break so many of these stereotypes. Maybe just in a, a few seconds, last week we were talking about a very common trend that is happening in the capital city where now certain communities have refused others to rent their houses uh, uh, in a perception that, hey, these communities are of a certain, uh, you know, uh, like they're not clean communities and when they take over your house, they don't want to leave. And like there are a lot of stereotypes that they have about certain communities. But then other landlords are coming out to speak about these communities and say, all right, so whatever is happening to you guys, uh, it's totally different on our case because we have had engagements with this community for some time and I think this uh, they're okay. So I think it's more like what are those exchanges that we are having uh, as different communities and, and how do we build trust uh, uh, by learning about each other? And also it's the same thing with the Yale and Mandela Oceano Fellowship, for example, we've been having perception about America based on, based on what we read and based on what we see. But, but now after having moments where uh, uh, through reciprocal exchange, Americans come to our countries to see what actually is here, their perception totally changes. So I think it's more like creating more spaces for us to engage talk to each other and, and now learn uh, uh, to change these stereotypes. Okay. Imran, I know that this gets to the core of your organization mm -hmm. and the work that mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. so, please. Yeah, you... yeah, exactly. Like uh, Nigeria as well is just like the two other countries. It's like so diverse and there is a lot of like uh, this kind of uh, ethnic tension where people tend to uh, perceive others differently, especially that we have history of civil war as well in the 1960s. So uh, one thing that we focus on a lot, I think, and it actually has a role to play in this regard, is uh, addressing hate speech online. When you uh, look at the comment section of uh, major newspapers online, you see every news story like is uh, being analyzed like from ethnic angle, from regional angle. Like everyone is just looking at the news. Where is the person from? Uh, why is this thing happening? Every political appointment. Everything, even like success story of like uh, people winning like sporting event or anything, people view it like from that ethnic original angle. So I think uh, all the issues they explain, like look by a Mavis explain, are actually like applicable in Nigeria. And I think when we uh, work alone online to counter hate speech to promote that uh, idea of uh, understanding and tolerance, it can actually play a role in addressing these issues. So is it fair to say that all three of you see uh, online hate speech as a problem? Do you all do you all see the uh, what the fallout of hate speech in your home country? It's a big one. Uh, it's a big problem, especially here. I mean, I mean, online hate speech is a is a big driver uh, of conflict, and I think there are huge campaigns. Uh, being involved in uh, to try to address hate speech both online and offline. And just like uh, Imran, I said everything. Uh, I thought this was mainly a South Sudanese thing because whatever we see in Nigeria, if if, uh, if, if, if a Nigerian has won something, we were like, oh, this is a Nigerian. We don't see that tribal aspect out here. So I thought maybe it's, it's only us as South Sudanese who have the tendency of saying, okay, I think so and so is from this community uh, and all that. So, so online hate speech is huge and anything that happens that is done by a particular person is usually attached to that person's group or identity. And, and most of the times it, it goes crazy. It goes crazy. Mavis, do you see the same thing? It's the same thing in Cameroon. It's just the same. Like when something goes wrong, they'll point directly at the tribe, a particular ethnic 
person directly involved. And uh, in Cameroon, they, they kind of like generalize people and call them by a derogatory tag of their, their tribe. All these ones are lazy. All these ones are, are these. All these ones are. They even go as far as attributing names like, mm -hmm. like, like dogs, cockroaches, and, 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 and frogs. So it, it becomes really tense and you find people go online creating fake social media accounts to propagate this, mm -hmm. this, this image. Like they'll create something that is fake, they, they pick up one particular incident and tack it to a particular ethnic group and then they start pushing forward the agenda. You really see that it is a very big problem that we have been trying as well to tackle in collaboration with some other local organizations because it is really one of the major issues, one of the, the trigger factors for the, the current uh, conflict that is going on in Cameroon as we speak. Uh, so I, I, I hate to tell you, but these problems, unfortunately, are worldwide. I don't know why it is that uh, people are so prejudiced and they tend not to see uh, faces and in individuals. They too often fall into stereotypes. And uh, unfortunately, bad actors know how to exploit stereotypes in ways that are certainly hurtful and hateful and sometimes just completely uh, dangerous and very, very dangerous. So uh, we are run, running out of time, but please, uh, to those who are watching and please join me in thanking our three speakers for a remarkable session. I hope you will join me in thanking them as well for the great work that they are doing to build a more sustainable peace in their communities and countries. I have been busily taking notes. I have learned a great deal from all of you. We have learned about the problems of uh, bad governance and how bad governance can, can frustrate and lead to conflict. We have learned about the need for seeing people as human beings first instead of where they come from. Uh, we have heard about the risks of excluding youth voices from uh, peace building efforts. And we have learned about the importance of education and how education help people to be better prepared. And when people are better educated, they have the tools that they need to make a great difference. But I will also say, perhaps more importantly, to me the great takeaway is the importance of YALI. And the fact that through YALI, 10 years in, uh, voices come together for sessions like this. And that to me is maybe the most important takeaway. So uh, as I said in an earlier session tomorrow, I think everyone that is listening in and certainly our three panelists, you not only have uh, great skills and tools and things that you have learned, but you have an obligation to apply them. Uh, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. We turn to you for building peace. You inspire us, you lift us up, and I think big and good things are ahead. So uh, thanks to all of you again for joining us today. And for those who are participating, uh, we look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow for what promises to be a very exciting day two of the summit. Thank you and congratulations on the work that you are doing. Take care, everyone. Thank you.